Okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the seven game main slate we have here on Monday, uh, May 22. Um, like these short, sort of mid range uh, type of slates, right? With the you know, six to nine games or something like that. Um, a lot of cool stuff we can do in tournaments. You can really embrace variance on these shorter slates uh, like this. And I don't think today is really any different. We've got uh, a Coors game here. Um, Eddie Cabrera on the mound for the Marlins. Probably a pretty attackable spot. And not totally sure. We don't have an announced starter just yet for Colorado. Um, but they are at the, uh, the Chase Anderson part of the rotation. He lasts through on the 16th, I believe. Um... But they did just, uh, they're like, they're missing arms. Like, they just need guys here, and it'll probably be him. But they just signed, like, a Luis Sessa, right, of Reds fame to a contract as well. And, yeah, so they may just try to piece together a bunch of stuff here. Um, so who knows what they are going to end up doing. It'll probably be Anderson, so that's why I've just got him in the sheet here. But we do have Gavin Stone up once again for the Dodgers since Dustin May has gone down. It was these two... Um, it, like, he was battling for a a spot coming out of spring training. Um, and he just missed out. But, uh, well, here he is now that... Uh, Dustin May has gone down. So uh, he gets Atlanta today. Pretty tough spot. Um, probably just a bullpen. Definitely just a bullpen game for San Francisco. I believe they're going to have um, Sean Mania come in after Brebbia here. But uh, Brebbia is still 12,000 or however much. 8,200 still over here on DK. Um, kind of frustrating there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, Javier and Corbin Burns in this Houston-Milwaukee game. Interesting pitching matchup there. Maybe we can get to some offense, and, and the big sort of chalk piece on the mound today is Luis Castillo at a very playable price tag here against Oakland tonight, who may be getting their best hitter back. So um, that said, we've got projections and ownership loaded to the side already. Keep an eye out for updates as always. Uh, I think we can make some decisions on the mound here today. And we can play some of these cheaper guys. I think they're down to maybe, I mean, probably not a Kyle Muller. But Gavin Stone, I think, is in play a little bit. Um, it's kind of a gulp in play. But um, Brady Singer, I think, is in play. Tanner Houck, eh, probably not. Michael Lorenzen may be in play, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just get into the games here, and we'll um, try and keep it relatively condensed, even though I say that every day. Um and we'll start with the Dodgers and the Braves. Gavin Stone at 5,400. I think this is a playable price tag for him. He is just a three-pitch guy uh, for the most part. Now, he might mix in a kind of you know, maybe, maybe a cutter uh, or like a slur or something like that as well. We do just have the one start here where he just relied on these few pitches uh, earlier in the season. He got picked apart in that, in that start a little bit, but he got the Phillies. Right, and it's not a uh, all that great a matchup for a guy just making his debut. Well, and here against it, Atlanta, that's really not all that great a matchup either. Uh, I think I would have to side with the offense just kind of by default here because this is Atlanta, but this is a pretty average offense against right-handers, right? Just a 98 WRC plus. They'll walk. They're going to strike out, and they're going to hit for some power. A lot of hard contact here. But really, they don't create a bunch. And really, they've only got the one guy in the entire lineup that does create runs for them on the base pass. And that's Acuna up at the top. I think he's a fantastic play here today. Even at 6,500, he's very expensive. But uh, the power is there. Extra bases are there. He's stealing bases. Um, he's hitting for average. Like, it's just... Whole nine yards with Acuna, he's worth every bit of that 65 at the top of the lineup. But the guys down below him, you kind of have to, you know, in order for the Braves to get there, you're kind of relying on them to just, like, hit around every inning, right, and hit the baseball over the wall uh, because they don't create otherwise, 
right? They don't hit for a lot. They're, they're not necessarily a team that is going to hit for average, right, against right-handed pitching, just a 235 aggregate average. So they're going to hit for power, and you need them to kind of get there. Now, the, the Dodgers' bullpen is very susceptible here, and if Gavin Stone does get picked apart a little bit, then, yeah, you're going to want to have some Braves. It's kind of a scary team to fade in this particular spot. Because if they can get to Gavin Stone, well, either he's going to have to wear a big number uh, or they're going to try and rely on their bullpen. And the Dodgers bullpen been pretty suspect uh, really all season. So um, I think there's a lot of upside here for the Braves. And they're really only going to come in probably, I don't know, I would say third or fourth in ownership, maybe, probably fourth of when we get down to lock here. And... That's kind of how we want to attack the Braves, right? They're very expensive, but they're popping pretty hard given those price tags in the value metrics. So I think this is a high upside spot for Atlanta. That said, you could still play some Gavin Stone if you land on this, if you need it. If you get to a very, like you play Dodgers on the other side, for example. This is, they're a very expensive stack as well. Mookie 6K, Freddie 51, Will Smith 53, Muncie 52. I mean, JD's even 49, right? So uh, if you want to, play kind of an off-the-board stack and go after some Charlie Morton here, I don't think this is bad at all. Like I said, we can make some decisions on some seven-game slates here that you probably normally wouldn't on a full 12-gamer or something. Like, do you really want to be going after one of the best arms on the day here? Uh, generally, no, right? But this is the Dodgers, still one of the best offenses in baseball, right? Team still, despite their pitching woes, 10 games over 500 here. 114 WRC plus, 11% walk rate. The strikeout rate is starting to tick down. Even though we attacked the Dodgers with some high upside righties earlier in the season, this is starting to correct a little bit. And they're still going to hit for a lot of power and a lot of hard contact and get the baseball in the air. So this is the Dodgers offense still sort of coming to the surface that we've we've known for the last you know decade nearly uh, over here in the uh, NOS. So um, very dangerous matchup here for Charlie at 9,400. This is actually like seasonal price highs for him. He's been hovering down in the mid 8K range. That's really where he's popped for most of his upside uh, so far this season. But he started this year, the year at 9,600 and kind of got beat up a little bit. And after that, his price was down in the mid 8K. So um, do we really want to be paying seasonal price highs for Charlie Morton, I mean, there's another guy, 200 cheaper, that we'll get to much later, who is a far better play, I think, and doesn't have near this kind of matchup. So um, this makes this difficult. Charlie is still even seeing a full 18% in ownership. I think there's plenty of other arms that we can play here today. I don't think we have to go after Charlie and, and, and target the Dodgers here, despite the fact that Charlie's been... Pretty serviceable this season. Certainly against lefties, he's managing the lefty problems that he's shown in the past, um, or he's he's exhibited in the past. He's managing them better this year, right? 25% aggregate K rate. The power is down a little bit. This was north of 180, 190 in the last couple of seasons. The average and the WOBA are still there because he's still having a little bit of trouble throwing this curveball for a strike to them, right? He's ticked up the curveball usage now in aggregate to a full 46. I mean, this is 50% of the arsenal. He's just throwing his curveball. So he's effectively a kind of a one-pitch guy here because all the other stuff is break-even to uh, pretty bad. And he's not throwing it a hell of a lot. So slightly suspect and rising walk rate here. It's not to the right-handers, of course. He's very good against the right side of the plate. Not so much in swing and miss. Um... He throws his curveball a little bit more for a strike, and he gets a lot of called strikes. High called strike rate here at 18%, keeping him above a 30% CSW. It's all great, and it's very encouraging for a guy this deep in, in his career that's really relying, similar to a Wainwright, just on one, really his best pitch. Uh, but he's still susceptible, certainly, to not inducing soft contact to the left side and giving up some hard contact and some barrels to the lefties. As I mentioned the walk rate here is pretty worrisome, north of 10%. The swing and miss is there a little bit to the left side. But 
as I mentioned, with the Dodgers here, their their lefties over here are not going to strike out nearly as much against right-handed pitching anymore. Freddie doesn't really strike out a lot. Muncie not so much against righties at least. Outman will, um, and maybe a David Peralta will a little bit, like a little bit, but it it's nothing super worrisome here. And they've got some righties like a Mookie and a Will Smith. Will Smith doesn't strike out at all. And a J.D. Martinez that hit righties pretty well also. So I think this is a very intriguing tournament stack here for the Dodgers going after some Charlie Morton. I think this ownership number might be a little bit aggressive here. Like I said, we're paying seasonal price size for him. And this is the, by far the worst matchup that he's had all season. And I, I think we could attack that in some tournaments. They're not popping in value because they're expensive. And that's going to keep their ownership way, way down. But once again, this is a seven-game slate. I think you can go after this. Now, if you want to play correlated Brave stacks with some Charlie Morton, yeah, go ahead. I, I think that's fine. But I think I would have to mostly side with offense here. I think everybody is pretty much in play. Um, Gavin Stone, mostly because of the price tag. Charlie, just because he's got some swing and miss stuff. And he's a good arm. But for the most part, these offenses, I think you've got to side with them. I mean, it's going to be warmish in Atlanta, today, and this is a hitter's ballpark down there. So uh, I think you can go after some offense for sure. Okay, let's move on to San Francisco and Minnesota. John Brebby on the mound, as we mentioned, he's still outrageously expensive for some stupid reason, and he's just going to open. It's probably going to be Sean Mania coming in after. I should just put him in the sheet. Um, don't know why I didn't. In any case... It'll likely be him, and he's still got major problems to right-handers, so I think you can get to some twins here as well. Now, they're going to pop a little bit harder in both value and ownership because they're cheaper, right? They're much more playable. Carlos Correa, 4,300. Buxton, he's not a playable 54, but um, stop me if you've heard this before. He's hurt again, so, uh, you know, we, we got to see what, what's going on with that. Um, I think he just had, like, a tight calf or something. May, hopefully just got the day off, but um, who knows? He probably strained his calf like walking down the uh, down to the clubhouse. Who knows? In any case, Kyle Farmer is at a playable 3,000. He's got a lot of pop uh, at third base. That's fine. And you can play either catcher behind the plate, Christian Vasquez, Ryan Jeffers, very playable price tags there. You can play Michael A. Taylor, who hits lefties very well, also at 2,300. So I think it's a... A nice little twin stack you can get to. I don't particularly want to mix in some of the lefties since Manaya is still okay. He'll give up a lot of hard contact, though, to the lefties, uh, and he's still very attackable. Brebia here is only going to go about an inning or, like, two max, so we can't really, um, you know, do structure stacks and construct stacks with a lot of lefties because, like, Joey Gallo's downside of his split, certainly against lefties, he's going to strike out probably a lot, even against Manaya, who doesn't strike out guys all that much anymore. Uh, Kirilov, you could play, certainly, if you want to add in a lefty piece or an Eddie Julian. That's fine now that Georgie Polanco has gone back on the DL. Uh, he's fine at 2,700, is Julian. So, very playable full twin stacks here, if you want to get there's warm in... Uh, in the Twin Cities tonight. So I think uh, near at 80 degrees, like target field plays up offense a little bit when it's that warm. So I think it's very reasonable to play some twins here against the Giants. Bailey Ober on the mound, I, I really like this play. Starting to see his ownership tick up a little bit here in the early goings. Uh, it started about 15, 18% in the early ownership runs this morning. At 8,100, I think this is very playable. Uh, I hate stacking against heavy fly ball pitchers, and that's what Bailey Ober really is. Four-seamer, curveball, slider, change, and all of them, every one of these pitches has been very equitable for him so far. He's got a little bit of susceptibility to some hard contact to the right side and and getting on a barrel a little bit there, um, but it's nothing, it hasn't translated so far, this is a short sample, of course, hasn't translated to power or, or anything like that quite yet. He's got a, a Real good change here, offering him a, a lot of value so far. Full 8-mile-an-hour velo delta to the fastball. Uh, really good balanced arsenal here in, in staying spread out, and he sequences very well. So um, the power and the, and the strikeout numbers are going to stay down and come up, respectively, against the left side as we get a, a larger sample here. So I, I like this here. 
There's a lot of chase in him with the slider curveball mix. He stays down in the strike zone with the changeup. Good swinging strikes. I'd like to see a little bit more called strikes out of him, and that would push the CSW up toward the 30% threshold that we really want to see. But for the most part, with a high chase rate, you could deal with uh, a lower called strike percentage. So uh, overall, throws strikes, doesn't walk people, and he's got good K stuff, uh, really to both sides of the plate. We want him mostly against very right ha- right-handed heavy teams, and the and the Giants anymore now that they're missing Jock, they're going a little bit more right-handed heavy now that they've got Casey Schmidt in the lineup pretty regularly. Um, missing Jock, it just takes that very high upside left-handed bat out of the lineup for them. So they got to fill it with something. And even though they do have a uh, Yastrzemski back, um, they'll keep, he'll keep them at with Conforto and like a Lamont Wade and, and whoever catcher they throw behind the plate or like a, a Brandon Crawford, they're still going to have five lefties or so in the lineup for sure. But they've got some more righties in here and that makes them a little bit more attackable with right-handers than they would have been earlier in the season, for example. So these these numbers against that, like we know who the Giants are, right? They're going to walk, they're going to strike out, and they're going to hit for a lot of power and try and hit the baseball out of the yard. So creation-wise, they're not going to steal a lot of bases. Uh, they're mostly just, you know, pretty slow and and going to try and hit the baseball over the wall and just jog around. So um, it's the hard contact and, and the fly balls that we really want to avoid. But over here... As we mentioned, like so far for Bailey Over, he's been very good against lefties, and that value is going to come up with the with the changeup against left-handers. So if you do want to attack some with some Giants against Bailey Over, if we see his ownership steam, you could get a little bit of leverage here. Um, you can do that certainly with some of these righties, like a JD Davis. He's a very playable 3600. Tyro at 5700. I'm not so sure about that, but uh, Mitch Haniger still playable 3100 as well. So if you want to mix in a Giants, a few giant stacks to your pools. I think this is perfectly viable. Once again, on a seven game slate, you can go after pretty much whoever you want um, and, and attempt to get a little bit of leverage here. Uh, I would side with Bailey over and the twins mostly, but I do think the giants are in play. I like playing Bailey over a good bit. Generally with very high fly ball rate pitchers, I like attacking teams who try to hit the baseball in the air. Uh, It's, not a good batted ball matchup, and you can often see a lot of swing and miss emerge from those types of matchups. So I usually side with the pitcher in, in those instances. Uh, but I, I do think the Giants here, because Ober is giving up a l- bit too much hard contact to the right side and some barrels here at a full 10%, I think some Giants are, are viable from the righties. And, you know, with the platoon, that makes them a, a viable stack. Okay, Houston and Milwaukee. Christian Javier and Corbin Burns on the mound. Uh, 10K for Javier. This is a pretty good pitching matchup. Both of these guys seeing a lot of ownership here. Um, I'm not so sure about the Corbin Burns ownership. But I'm okay with going after 33% ownership on on Christian Javier here. Uh, the K stuff is still exceptional. Um, it's been down in, here or there in a matchup or two. He's always had trouble throwing strike one. But he's got so much chase... And very high whiff stuff, really to both sides of the plate. Hasn't quite materialized just yet this year uh, against the left side of the plate. But this will balance out as this sample sort of balances out a little bit more. His problem has really always been hard contact to the right side. And he'll give up some power, but it's not really an average. So he's very hard to stack against in that regard because he doesn't walk people. So really, it's just homer hunting against Christian Javier with guys that will mostly hit the baseball on the line because he is also a very heavy fly ball pitcher with the four-seamer slider mix here. He gets a lot of pop-ups with this with this curveball, doesn't really throw the change up en- enough. That'll give him more swing and miss if he used this more. But mostly a, a pretty equitable four-seamer slider mix, and he's, he does still get some whiffs with the curveball. So uh, he'll give up a little bit of power, as you can see here with a 228X ISO to both sides of the plate. But again, it's not an average. So it's very hard to full stack against Christian Javier because he gets so many balls in the air and a lot of them are are with soft contact, as we see here, pushing 38% soft contact rate to the left side of the plate. It's equal to the hard contact rate. Like that is, that that's insane. That's off the charts good. So 
despite the fact that he's not throwing a change and he will give up a little bit of pop over the wall to some lefties sometimes, most everything in here is just popped up. It's not really on a line. Line drive rate, sub 20%. It's just to the righties where he gets on the barrel a little bit, full 12%, and this is mostly to the right side here. So he'll give up some pop to a couple of these righties. And if you want to play a couple of leverage pieces from Milwaukee, um, not my favorite going after full stacks here, for sure, but you could play a Willie Adamas. He's 3,900. That's fine. You could play a Willie Contreras behind the plate at 37. That's okay, too. And Brian Anderson, if you want to get there at 3,200, that's all right as well. But all right as well. These guys are going to strike out in this matchup, though. He's got very, very high chase and strikeout rates to the right side. So it's super dangerous and a high variance tournament play. Um, but that's probably how I'd, I'd want to attack it. This isn't just short sample noise against or for the righties against uh, Christian Javier. This has basically persisted his entire career. Um, but I'm okay eating 30-plus percent ownership on Javier here. I think it's a very high upside matchup for him in particular because the Brewers, even against righties, where they create a hell of a lot better than they do against lefties, are still just league average in every single metric, and they're going to strike out still at a 23% clip. They'll walk, but they don't hit for nearly as much power as they have in the past. And the hard contact rate is, while above 30%, it's still not uh, outsized necessarily. So uh, they're going to hit a lot of ground balls, and that will yield some more line drives in this particular matchup for them. But once again, they pop up a lot of balls too. Full 12% infield fly ball rate here, and that's pretty high. And against a fly ball pitcher, that's not a good recipe generally. So I'd mostly just be homer hunting here against Javier for leverage pieces with a cheap Willy, Adamas, or Contreras. Um, Corbin Burns on the mound for the Brewers. 9,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's basically at the same price tag he's been. And this is an okay matchup, right, based on the aggregate numbers for the Astros. But they just got Jose Altuve back. And this K rate is going to tank now with him back at the top of the lineup. This run creation is also going to spike pretty hard when he gets going too. The whole lineup has mostly been pretty cold because they haven't had any production up at the top. They've had to put Mauricio Dubon, Dubon up there. Alex Bregman really hasn't gotten going just yet. Jordan Alvarez hasn't gotten going just yet. So they're not hitting for any aggregate power here. No hard contact. But all these numbers are going to start to tick up now that they've got Altuve. Bregman is starting to heat up. And as we get into the summer and Jordan stays a little bit healthier. He's been dealing with some nagging stuff. Um, these guys are going to heat up, and hopefully Josie Abreu, they either get him out of the four hole or he starts heating up one of the two. He's also been a kind of an anchor right there in the middle of the lineup, dragging all of these numbers down. Kyle Tucker really hasn't gotten going either. So um, still a very dangerous list to go after. However, Corbin Burns has a really, really good pitch against the left side of the plate in particular in the cutter. Probably one of the best cutters for a starting pitcher in baseball. And he induces a lot of soft contact to them, as you can see in aggregate. He's a lot of hitters here to the left side. A full 18% and a very low hard contact rate. So he gets the baseball on the ground against left-handers. Jordan and Kyle Tucker, they're going to hit the baseball in the air, though. So that will turn into line drives for them. So I think this is an okay matchup. They, they both hit cutters very, very well historically. So... Um, Eating a full 30% ownership on Corbin Burns here seems a little aggressive. The, the K stuff for him just has not been there this season. He's down to about 21.5% in aggregate. The chase rate is not there. He's still getting called strikes, but the swing strike rate has dropped a couple of ticks here in the last couple of seasons. He's still above a 30% CSW, and, and called strikes and whiffs are, are called strikes and whiffs. That's really what we want to target generally. He's not walking a lot of people, he's staying off the barrel, and he's getting ground balls to the left side where he, he would be most susceptible. But look at this delta in the, in the ground ball to fly ball and the line drive ratios to the right side from the left side. 40% hard contact to the righties here with a, just a 149 ISO. Like they'll, They're going to hit for a lot more average against him, will the righties. And the strikeout rate is below average, as we mentioned, to both sides of the plate. So I think he's susceptible to some of these righties here. And certainly I don't want to go out of my way to be targeting Jordan Alvarez and Kyle Tucker with a right-hander, uh, even though Corbin Burns has a really good cutter here and that, that can induce some soft contact. 
Um, so I think at this particular price tag in this matchup, at this owner, certainly at this ownership figure, I think these numbers are a little bit high. The the median projection seems a a tad aggressive for me. I know they've been striking out. Like I said, that the whole dynamic of their lineup has changed now that Altuve is back, and I think these numbers are probably a bit aggressive. Um, and I think we can get to some Houston Astros stacks. Now they're way down the list in value because you got to pay for Alvarez and Kyle Tucker and Altuve now. Uh, and this is Corbin Burns. It's not like he's a total gas can on the mound, but I think you can play some leverage stacks here. I think these numbers are probably a bit outside where they should be. Um, that said, Corbin Burns still has plenty of upside to pick through these guys if they're still just going to be cold. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not encouraged really by this depressed strikeout rate and some susceptibility to the right side here. Like you, Altuve, Bregman, Alvarez... And, and Kyle Tucker, like, these guys aren't really going to strike out against right-handed pitching. It's going to make it very difficult to get through down to the bottom of the lineup where there are some strikeouts. So uh, I think the strikeout upside here for Corbin Burns in particular is pretty depressed. And at this ownership, I'm not super interested. So um, mostly just Javier and the Astros here for me and maybe some Milwaukee leverage pieces. Uh, just a one-off or two, I think. Okay, Detroit and Kansas City. I think both arms are in play here. I'm more intrigued with Brady Singer because he's cheaper and he has historically more strikeout stuff than Michael Lorenzen. He's on the mound for the Tigers at 7,800. Um, I, I just rarely play Lorenzen. Now, his last, what, three starts have been very good. He has shown a little bit more strikeout stuff this season, I would say, than he has historically. This has been this is about up four ticks, I would say, from last year's numbers. But four ticks when you go from 14 to 18 percent in DFS is not really all that uh, all that impressive, uh, to say the least. However, he's throwing a lot of strikes here. He's not walking people, and he's really staying off the barrel, getting some ground balls, certainly to the right side, less so to the left side. Uh, but that makes him very serviceable. And for Michael Lorenzen, this CSW number pushing 20, this is a high number for him, to be quite honest. It's it's mostly because of the called strikes, staying down in the strike zone with the change-up slider combination because there's nothing here in, in the way of swinging strikes. And that's what really makes him difficult to play in DFS a lot of the time. But he's been very good and well around the strike zone uh, and, and pretty serviceable for the Tigers here. So I think he is in play. I am not wild about this price tag, though. Even in this particular matchup, the Royals are bad against right-handed pitching. And, but he's still going to pitch to a full 82% contact here. Like, he, he's not going to throw it past them. That's really how we want to attack the Royals a lot of the time. He could suppress here for sure, but he's got some a little bit of susceptibility with some aggregate hard contact rates north of 30% to both sides of the plate. That's really how the Royals can excel against righties. 34% aggregate hard contact. That's a pretty big number, and they don't hit for a lot of soft contact, sub 17% as a team here. So they're going to get it on the line and hit it in the air. And even though they don't create, it's because they strike out so much for the most part. They don't walk a lot because they've got some chase in them. But um, for the most part, Michael Lorenzen doesn't really have a lot of chase here, just a 28.5% O swing rate. So without swinging strikes, without chase, he's going to be around the strike zone. It's going to make it a lot easier for the Royals to get there today, I think. And I think this is a fine tournament stack if you want to play them. Uh, Vinny just got a day off yesterday. He should be back. Bobby Witt and Salvi are, are back and more expensive now. Uh, back up to their price tags, that is. 5400 for Bobby Witt. But I think this is a pretty upside spot for him, as it is for Salvi. His main problem is Chase. But at 5100 he's got plenty of it, probably the most upside for any catcher on the slate today. Um not including guys at like Coors Field, for example. So I think the Royals here are a, a pretty decent tournament stack. It's 75, 80 degrees in, in KC today. And I think this is, you know, the ballpark's going to play up power there a little bit and play up offense when it's warm. Um, plays a little bit more similar to Coors Field. It's a big, big yard over here when the weather is warm. And guys can just run forever. So, uh, baseball can fly over there a little bit, and against Lorenzo, he's going to pitch to a lot of contact, 
and he will give up some balls in the air to the left side of the plate here. So um, I think this is okay to get to some Royals. You can still play MJ, and you can still play play Nick Prado. You can also play these righties. Look at this soft contact rate induced. Yeah, these are short samples, yeah. But he's given up a, a 388 average to the righties so far this year with a 389 Woba. Like, those numbers are equal. I don't know how that happens. It's because he doesn't walk anybody, so it's all contact, right? And a sub-14% strikeout rate to the right side with a 5% soft contact rate. Um, it, it, it's it's a little susceptible here. So I think there we might be seeing a little bit of noise in Lorenzen's numbers in terms of raw suppression here. Um, but everything has is, is been good and encouraging, so I do think he's in play. But I'd, I'd probably just side with the Royals here, even though I side with the Royals every day, and I lose money on it every single day. Brady Singer on the mound for them. 7000 I like this price tag for him. Um, He's he's really struggled this year. He's had trouble kind of locating, getting ahead in counts. He's really just over the middle of the damn plate. No chase. The chase is totally evaporated for Singer. Like, he, he normally gets a lot of called strikes, and that those two numbers generally go hand in hand when you've got a good bit of chase and a good bit of called strikes. That's because he tries to stay down in the, in the strike zone here with this slider, really to both sides of the plate. Uh, and with the sinker as well. It keeps him up near a 29% CSW, and he throws a lot of strikes. Doesn't walk people. The problem is his location has just been really dreadful so far this season, and it is just the two-seamer that he's thrown. It's not a very good pitch to opposite-handed hitters, so that makes him very susceptible to left-handers, and as we see here, that's really showing out. 303 average, 410 Wobe, and a 283 ISO to the left side. Um... You know, the walk rate hasn't totally ballooned here, but that's really kind of what's gotten him in trouble. He has been nibbling a little bit, and then he kind of gets behind in some counts, and he's just throwing it right over the middle of the damn plate. 47.5% hard contact rate to the left side. I think these numbers are a bit outsized for his historical, um, his, his, his historical performance, I should say. So I think they're probably going to see some regression here, and this is the Tigers, right? They're going to strike out a lot. So despite the fact that his strikeout numbers are down this season, I think this is a pretty high upside spot for him. And he's popping to a pretty decent projection so far for a guy at, at 7,000. I think this is a playable number. He's still getting a lot of ground balls to the right side here. So if he can increase the, the whiff stuff a little bit, and just stay off of the damn barrel to the left side, it's going to make him pretty serviceable, and I think he can suppress here a pretty, um, a, at a, a pretty respectable clip against the Tigers. They're, they're terrible against right-handed pitching. 79 WRC plus, 24% aggregate K rate, no power, a little bit of hard at 31%, but like whatever, um, 284 WOBA. So just an average walk rate at 8% here. So uh, I think Brady Singer is very well in play, and some co coordinated Royal stacks with him uh, are pretty off the board. Uh, it's dangerous, don't get me wrong. This barrel rate is very attackable in general. Um, I think the hard contact will probably regress. The barrel rate probably will come down as well. But you see here, he's got a 4.5 XBIT, but expected ERA metrics and realized metrics uh, north of, or pushing 7, and north of 7 even. Strain rate here at 55%. This is mega, mega low. So this is going to regress a little bit. And if we're looking for like a, a luck metric or anything, it's not BABIP, it's really strain rate. Um, so 55% is insanely low. So I think we're going to see some positive regression for Brady Singer at some point. I'm not sure if it comes today, but, I mean, this is the Tigers. It, it could very well come today. I don't really want to play any of them, but if you want to stack the Tigers, yeah, go ahead. Um, because these numbers are bad against Singer, Zach McKintree's fine, 3900 I don't really want to pay 46 for Baez or 47 for Riley Green. But everybody else is cheap. Like Nick Maton's the 2800 he's fine. Torque is 3000 he's fine too. And a low strikeout rate so far this season, sub-17%. That's attackable with uh, with Tiger stacks here. So if you want to do that, they're cheap and, and they're playable, just popping in middle sort of value and ownership numbers so far. So uh, it, it's okay. I'd mostly side with pitching in the Detroit KC game and and some Royal stacks. I like going after a little bit of, of Lorenz in there. Okay, let's move on to Coors Field, Miami and Colorado. Uh, Eddie Cabrera at 8,300. First of all, we're not playing him. He, he's 
overpriced, number one. Uh, number two, despite the fact that he's got strikeout stuff, he throws a curveball. He has horrible, horrible fastball value, even though he's got a little bit of velo. He's got some value on the changeup, but this is not really a changeup. This is a three and four mile an hour velo delta to the fastball mix. This is a, a third fastball, right? It just so happens that it's, I mean, it's a regular three mile an hour shorter than the than the other two. So, um, you know, in terms of like a raw velo comp, it, it'd be more similar to a cutter or something like that, even though it is a an actual, you know, change up grip. Nevertheless, his money making pitch has really been the curveball. Um, and that's where he get gets most of the swing and miss. He's got a live arm here to Zeddy, and we're really waiting for him to tone down this freaking walk rate. Sixteen percent in aggregate. It's to both sides. It's not really to lefties or to righties. It's to both sides of the plate. Fifty four percent strike one rate. Super difficult to overcome this, especially when your best secondary pitch is I'm 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 calling the changeup uh you know a primary pitch here for our purposes here today, uh and it, it, when your best secondary pitch is a curveball that this is not going to work well at Coors Field so if you got a bad fastball mix with a changeup that's really no different than the fastballs and you're not throwing a slider a lot to try to stay down the strike zone your best pitch is not going to break the same as it does in Miami at Coors Field. It's just not going to happen. So I really like getting to the Rockies here today as kind of an under-owned stack. Not to, I mean, they're going to be, whatever, third in ownership probably. But given this, like, this is 25% of the arsenal here, and it's a curveball. It's just not going to do nearly what it does at sea level when you're at, uh, when you're at altitude here. So um, it, it's just... I like getting to Colorado, and I like getting to a lot of the Rockies. Look at this hard contact rate against the right side, 43% with a sub-10% soft contact rate, 24% line drives, 284 average allowed, 380 Woba, and a 164 ISO. That ISO number is going to come up dramatically if these average and Woba numbers persist. Like I said, he's walking people, and he's got a curveball. This is a horrible, horrible recipe for him at Coors Field. He could make me look stupid because he's still got swing and miss. And if the curveball's biting for him a little bit more than... I mean, his curveball's better than most curveballs in Major League Baseball. So it's not totally crazy that his curveball works at Coors a little bit better. Um, but it's still a curveball, right? And he's still going to need the same sort of break on it uh, he's just not going to get it, right? That uh, the same sort of break that he will get at at sea level. So I want to attack with some righties here. You could attack with a couple of lefties. It'd be mostly the line drive hitters though, because he does stay down in the strike zone with this change curveball mix. Uh, but the fastball is very attackable here, and that's going to give him a little bit more fly ball lean. And especially if he's going to be floating this curveball when it doesn't break for him. So uh, you should see more line drives out of this arsenal at Coors Field, and I think that means you could play pretty much everybody on the Rockies, but uh, who knows what they're going to do with their lineup today. I don't think Buddy Black has any clue how to really construct something um, as far as, like, putting guys in really equitable spots. So that's kind of, you know, we got to deal with that. But uh, whoever's in the lineup, I think you can play him, really, no matter who it is, uh, and attack some Eddie Cabrera. Chase Anderson, like I said, we're not sure if it's going to be him. Probably be him, so we'll just go over his numbers here. He was good against the Reds in his last start, and he's stretched out enough that he can go a full five innings here. And this is Miami, right? They're still bad, and they're popping so far. And we're kind of deep in, in the morning here, and ownership runs at a full 20% in ownership. This is way high, I think. This, this offense is awful. 24% aggregate carry with an 83 WRC plus and a 128 ISO. Um, that's really not encouraging. I don't care what play, what ballpark you're playing at. Like, they don't have anybody from the left side. Not that you really want anybody from the left side, but, like, their best hitter, Jazz Chisholm, is out. Uh, I mean, best power hitter, that is. Obviously, their best hitter is Luis Arise, but he's 5,500. You really want to pay that for him? I mean, he's can certainly... If, there's any ballpark in baseball will, where he will pay off that price tag on a regular basis. Uh, it's Coors Field, definitely. Like he could hit two doubles and a single, drive in two runs and and score two runs tonight, and that's that's 20 points or whatever. Um, and that's perfectly serviceable for you at 5,500. 
So these guys are they're playable. Georgie Soler, obviously, he's a fantastic play today. I'm not going to deny that. 5,300, because when we want to go after Chase Anderson, it's mostly historically been with righties. He's always had a very good changeup. And and he's now neutralizing a lot of the power to lefties as well since he's introduced the cutter here in the last several years. So the cutter change mix is going to make him elite against lefties still, and it's it's going to sort of exacerbate the um, reverse split that he has exhibited really his entire career against right-handers. We don't have any real sample sample here uh, to go on, so we can't you know judge value metrics or or anything like that. Not a high upside play, so you can't really play him. 6,500. If he were 5,500, though, I think this would be very reasonable to consider. Um, not at 65, though, however. So you can certainly play Miami, but I think their ownership probably right now is a little bit high. Once again, the Rockies' bullpen has been good, even though they're starting to run out of gas. They gave up a bunch of crooked numbers against Texas over the over the weekend. So they're starting to get very attackable. Uh, and if this is a true bullpen game, I mean, they just had to sign the Wiesessa. So if they bring him into the ball game, then yeah, it's all go on all things Miami. So um, they're very playable. Don't get me wrong. You play pretty much everybody. Brian De La Cruz, really good play here. Joey Wendell's 2,600. That's pretty good play too. Um, you can play them all, but I think I'd have to side with the Rockies at the at the ownership. And I like to bat a ball matchup a little bit better. Okay, let's go to uh, Boston and the Angels. Uh, Tanner Houck on the mound for... Uh, he's just underwhelming, you know, for the Red Sox. I, I don't know. Like, I don't like him at the mid-7Ks and 8Ks in the price tag. Uh, I just... I'm not... I'm not all that encouraged by the Arsenal. He's throwing five pitches, you know, which keeps him, like, serviceable enough as a starter. But he's just like a back-end starter. He doesn't have anything overwhelming. He doesn't have any chase in him whatsoever. Sub 60% strike one, it's like, eh. You know, he's got some swinging strikes and some called strikes that are pushing the CSW to 30% nearly. But, like, I don't know. Like, he just doesn't have raw whiff stuff. I Like, where, if if the CSW is this high, where are the strikeouts, you know? Um, so he's keeping the ball mostly on the ground. He's really just kind of a contact guy. That is underwhelming in terms of strikeouts. So uh, I'm not in, encouraged about going after the Angels here. They're a pretty damn good team against right-handed pitching, even though some of these metrics here are just about average pretty much across the board. They're very dangerous here. Uh, they, they, they did lose one of their low strikeout bats and Anthony Rendon, who was hurt again. Um, but you still got to get through Trout and Otani and, and Taylor Ward's been a little bit better. You got to get through Jared Walsh now, who hits righties exceptionally well. Very good to see him back after thoracic outlet. Um, he's 2,300. I love that play at first base here today. You want to play some angel stacks here. I like this a pretty good bit. Now, they're they're going to pop a little bit, maybe even higher in ownership than the Rockies, for example. I like, really like Colorado. But I think this is a, a very viable play here, playing some Angels, maybe like a three or a four man. You want to play Trout, Otani, Jared Walsh, throw in Matt Dice behind the plate or something like that, and then round it out with a five man with any one of Ward, Renfro, or Brandon Drury. I think this is all very playable here. And Tanner Houck, like I said, he's just kind of underwhelming. I don't want to play him at this price tag. I don't think anything in the arsenal is all that equitable. Um, fine cutter here so far in the eight starts, and that'll keep the baseball on the ground and help him neutralize it a little bit, but he's getting no value out of the off-speed split here. So that's going to make him really vi uh, vulnerable, rather, to the left side of the plate. And as we can see, a slightly elevated average, 259 with a 349, or 343 Wolva, rather, and a 223 ISO to the lefties. Just no swing and miss here. 40% hard contact nearly to the left side with no soft contact. So uh, I think it's very attackable here with some left-handers. 24% line drive rate is a pretty worrisome number. Give me Jared Walsh and give me Otani for sure, even though Otani is expensive. But I like Trout as well. High, high ground ball rate for Hauk. And Trout is a mega fly ball hitter. So this translates into a lot of line drives, and and Trout can can really excel in this particular matchup. Um, when Hauk really doesn't have a hell of a lot to go after him with, he's not going to throw this cutter. If he throws it to a right-hander, it's going to tail right back over the middle of the plate to, to righties, and 
it's going to be right on the barrel. So that's not a pitch you want to go after, and everything else is pretty bad. So uh, I think a, a three-man Trout, Otani, Jared Walsh is very equitable here for the Angels, uh, or even full stacks if you want to go there. Um, Jaime Barria on the mound for the Angels. Now, he is a little bit stretched out here. He's 7,900. I don't think we could play this. He's probably only going to go a max of four innings or something like that. Um, so not super interesting there. But he could suppress here for three, four innings. He's got pretty decent strikeout stuff and a pretty good four-seamer slider mix. Uh, now, he's got the changeup and the two-seamer a little bit that are keeping him a bit more down in the strike zone than a, a four-seamer slider mix would otherwise generally suggest. That's kind of a fly ball, uh, lean sort of arsenal. But he's got the other two pitches. So it's okay here for Jaime Barria to suppress a little bit. I'm not playing him, and I really don't like playing right-handers against the Red Sox, really, uh, no matter who they are, to be quite honest. Um, this is a very dangerous team against right-handed pitching. One of the best in the league, split-adjusted, 19% strikeout rate with a 271 average they heals they still hit for a lot of average here even though their run creation isn't spiking up to 120 and and you know numbers like we see from the dodgers for example 32 percent hard contact pretty good number buck 20 ground ball to fly ball it's pretty good number they don't pop a lot of balls up and they're pretty balanced here solid 185 iso with a 341 woba I think this is a playable stack here from Boston as well. However, I'd probably come off of them a little bit more. Not super intrigued because Mastaki Yoshida is 5,800 now and Rafi Devers 5,900. So to play the guys that you want to play, uh, like you got to pay for 6,000. Like pay 6,000 for them, rather. And when we're doing that, I think I'd rather just go to the other side of the game and play Trout and Otani. Um the Angels are going to be a little bit cheaper for he has a full stack because Verdugo at 4,500, he I mean, he's 45. Justin Turner is okay here at 36, I suppose. Uh, not super jacked about playing him at first base generally. Jaron Duran is going to strike out a little bit here in this matchup, but he's fine. 3,800. Tristan Costa is going to strike out a lot, uh, but he's 2,200. So similar stacks here and similarly priced. Batted ball-wise, um... I would rather go and play the Angels and go after Tanner Houck. I just don't think his arsenal is, is nearly as equitable as a Jaime Berea, for example. But um, I don't really want to play either of these guys, so I'd rather just get to offense. And I think this is a pretty viable tournament game here for us. Um, they're going to be kind of down the in the middle of the pack in, in ownership here tonight. So I think it's very viable. Uh, if you want to get off of some of the Coors Field or the Seattle ownership who we're going to get to right now, I think this is pretty playable, uh, both sides there. Really no pitching. Um, no pitching for Oakland for me either, once again. Uh, Kyle Muller on the mound, you just can't do it. I mean, even at 5,000, and even though the, the Mariners have been pretty atrocious against left-handed pitching this year, 83 WRC plus, 27.5% K rate with a 154 ISO, no hard contact, no soft contact. It's mostly just medium and just kind of eh, kind of type of contact here. But a 284 Woba against lefties in a 500 PA sample, I still don't want to play Kyle Muller, <laughs> you know, because he's got a 343 realized average allowed to the right side with a 410 Woba and a 195 ISO. 217 X ISO, and that's an aggregate to both sides of the plate. He just has no swing and miss whatsoever. 14.5% aggregate K rate. Got a little bit more swing and miss against the right side, but it's still 16%. I don't really care about that. 45% um, hard contact is out of control bad with a 12.5% soft contact. There's no soft contact here, high hard contact, and I think this is a pretty decent spot for the Mariners to kind of get off the schneid here against left-handed pitching. There's no chase here. He has trouble getting behind in counts, or getting ahead in counts, I should say, and that translates to walks, and he's on the barrel here. So, uh, this is really a perfect recipe. We've been stacking against Kyle Muller literally every game all season, and I I don't really see a reason to stop, to be quite honest. Um, in his last three starts, given up five earned, six earned, and five earned. At, the walks are there, like I said, and the barrels are there. The hard contact is there. So I think this is a very attackable spot for the Mariners. They're going to be popular, however, and probably come in second in ownership to Miami. 
Um, doesn't mean they're a bad play. I, I do like them. They're probably the top stack of the day, I would say, um, even though they've been very underwhelming and they're not playing a Coors Field. And on the mound for them, you can play some correlated stacks. However, you got to eat 55% ownership on Luis Castillo, too. Um, that's kind of difficult. However, he's just raw, he's just flat underpriced for this particular matchup. Now, his, his last few outings have not been good. We've talked about that a little bit, that there's some susceptibility for him when he gets up to the you know $10,000 range in, in salary. And a lot of the risk is, is not priced in at that point. Um, or is, you know, we kind of get priced out. It's an easier way to say it. Uh, when he's that expensive, because he's still got a very bad change up here that he's throwing too much. And he comes in three quarters. He's, he throws a sinker a lot still. So there's a, a, a really susceptible two C or a two pitch arsenal mix here with the sinker change that he throws a lot to the left side of the plate. That is not good. And here we see it again with a 245 average. That's a fine number. 324 Wobe, a fine number because they didn't walk people, but a 202 ISO. 38% hard contact to the left side of the plate still. So Luis Castillo is regressing pretty hard now back to his old bad changeup and bad sinker days um, that he exhibited you know, when he was with the Reds um, against left-handers. So, like, so this is pretty concerning here. And if you want to get off of some of this 55% ownership, Luis Castillo, I think that's fine. Like, you don't have to play him. I'd much rather play him, let me be clear, than Corbin Burns. Um, but if you want to pivot and, and go a different route, play a uh, a Christian Javier and uh, who else do we talk about? Like a Brady Singer or, or play a Bailey Ober or something like that as well. You don't have to eat this tonight. Because, as I alluded to earlier, Oakland is getting probably their best hitter back uh, in Seth Brown tonight. Um, he's had a successful rehab, and he should be good to go. And he is 3,300, and he's going to hit right in the middle of the lineup. Um, and he hits right-handers exceptionally well. I think it's a killer leverage play. He's really going to be kind of off the board. And as a full stack... I don't think this is totally crazy. Now, they're, despite them being very cheap, um, this is still, like, you still have to side with Luis Castillo here. But you could play Oakland. This is only a seven-game slate. And you could attack some of these really, really vulnerable numbers here to lefties. But he's still giving up hard contact to righties as well. This is a huge number. He's got a 194x ISO. And despite the, a 28% strikeout rate, that's a very attackable figure there with 39% hard contact. 50% um, ownership, you could come off of that. You can come in under, definitely, and then play some Oakland stacks on the other side. You could play a Jerry Ruiz. You could play Ryan Noda and Brent Rooker for sure. You could play Seth Brown, round it out with a Jace or a Shea Langoliers. I think this is a perfectly playable Oakland stack. Not going to get to it in outsized exposures necessarily, but um, to hedge some of this or leverage some of this ownership, I think this is perfectly playable. Don't get me wrong, I'm I'm going to have a lot. And if you're playing single entry and, and stuff like that, you probably just land on Luis Castillo no matter what. I think the, he's just underpriced for this particular matchup. Um, but the dynamics of this lineup, some of the Houston have changed now that they are getting their best hitter back. So um, keep that in mind. And if you see Seth Brown get into Luis Castillo for a, you know, two-run double in the first inning, yeah, don't be shocked here. Uh, he is very, very equitable against right-handed pitching. So uh, I, I I, really like the Mariners, of course, and we're just going to go after it. Like, Casillo's going to get run support, so even if he gives up two, three runs or whatever, he's probably still going to go six innings, strike out seven, and he might even squeeze a win out of it. So, you know, it's still a viable play here. Um, but in tournaments, if you want to get different a little bit and come off of some of this ownership – and play something else that's super chalky, then I, yeah, my blessing, you know, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, no Kyle Moeller though. You can't really do that. You play pretty much everybody on Seattle, Ty France, Gino Suarez, Julio, of course, uh, Tay Oscar's still 3,600. AJ Pollock, he's going to pop really hard in value today at 23. You can play all of them. So um, no problems there. I think that's uh, very playable, very viable to get to a good bit of the Mariners. Um, 
Okay, so let's. Uh, that's it for the breakdown. Let's just go over um, stacks here. Uh, sorry, we just got to some news about a probable starter. Nope, it's for the White Sox. So not for the Rockies. So not really relevant to our business here. Uh, let's go over stacks. Dodgers, Atlanta. I think you get to offense here in this game pretty much all the way around. Like I said, I think all, everybody here is pretty playable. Charlie Morton and Gavin Stone. Less so on Charlie Morton. Probably more bullish on Gavin Stone at uh, 4K cheaper, to be quite honest. Um, equally bad matchups for, for both of these guys, though. But a very interesting tournament game. San Francisco and the Twins. Uh, I like the Twins here a pretty decent bit. Um, I don't want to stack against Bailey Ober. I like him on the mound a lot at 20% ownership. I think this is how we can get a little bit different today. I think this is fine. Play some correlated twin stacks. Maybe just a three-man because they are going through a bullpen game here. And I don't really want to play Joey Gallo because he stinks. Um, you play Alex Kirilov, though. That's, that's fine, though. And play some of these righties who are bound to regress. I think Correa is starting to figure it out a little bit here. Like offense, they're a, a, a decent bit. You can play some giant stacks, though, if you want. Houston, Milwaukee. I like Houston here a little bit of some really off-the-board stacks. I think the 30% ownership of Corbin Burns probably a bit high. Um, and I think we could probably get different with, like, a, a Javier and a, a Bailey over construction or something like that. Play some a couple of Houston pieces. Play some leverage. Jordan Alvarez, one of the best hitters in the game. You know, you could absolutely do that. Uh, against Corbin Burns. Uh, he's he's in play. Don't get me wrong. Not my favorite on the mound, though, today. Uh, probably just some one-off pieces for Milwaukee against Christian Javier's right-handed problems. Detroit and Kansas City. I like a little bit of the Royals here going after some Lorenzen, but I think both pitchers are in play here as well. I would side with Brady Singer. I think his price tag is a little bit more attractive, and the matchup is more attractive, I think. But Lorenzen has been very serviceable. I'm not super interested in Detroit today because I, I think Brady Singer is going to regress positively. But undoubtedly, he has been pretty terrible this season. So if you want to play some left-handed Detroit pieces, I think that's okay. Miami and Colorado, you just got to balance the Miami ownership here. Um, and honestly, I don't think it's all that great a batted ball matchup, whether it's Chase Anderson. I think it's going to be Chase Anderson starting for them. Uh, I'd rather just get to the Rockies. They're a far lower ownership. At about, uh, what, 40% of the ownership that Miami's coming in right now. And I think this is fine. Like, you want to, like, don't fade, like, Jorge Soler or anything like that. Uh, or Luis Arise or anything like that. Or Brian De La Cruz, right? Um, but full Miami stacks at, at a full 20% ownership, I think that's kind of aggressive. Uh, I really do like Colorado and a lot of these righties. Eddie Cabrera's curveball is not going to work nearly as well at Coors Field. So I like offense there for sure. Can't really take any shots on Eddie, even though he's got a 30% K rate. You just can't do it. Um, Boston and the Angels, I like offense here too. I don't want to play Tanner Houck. I think he's, he's just like pretty average and below average. And Jaime Barr is really not stretched out enough to make playing him at 7,900 or whatever a viable construction. So it's offense only. I like the Angels mostly. But you can play Boston too. They're excellent against right-handed pitching. And Oakland-Seattle, you can play a really off-the-board Oakland stack here. Maybe just a couple of singleton pieces against Luis Castillo and getting off of some of this 55% ownership that we're going to see on him. But undoubtedly, he is the top arm. And this is, I think for me, the top stack of the day. Um, right up there with some of these other kind of tournament plays that we've already discussed. Uh, I like really like going after Kyle Muller. Uh, I think he's by far, as is the Oakland bullpen, the most attackable spot here today. So, um I'm not going to fade any Luis Castillo or anything, but if you want to get off of it, you know, Seth Brown's a damn good hitter. So uh, that's it, guys, for the stacks and the breakdown. Once again, keep an eye out for projections and ownership pushes. All throughout the day, we uh, try and push those every couple hours uh, with a shorter sort of seven-gamer here. We won't get lineups rolling in until later on in the afternoon. Um, so that's really when things will pick up in that regard. But keep an eye out for pushes as things will change throughout the day. And keep an eye out for what the Rockies do. If they start Luis Sessa, that's like a, you know, a pretty easy pivot to smash a lot of Miami, for example. Um, so that said, good luck, and we'll catch you guys tomorrow for a big Tuesday. Good luck.